in a new place. This uh, seamount has never been explored before, so it's a surprise to all of us uh, what we're seeing. Um, based on our previous experiences in areas similar to this, we expected to see a few more corals, which is why a few people have made the comment that they're surprised that there isn't a, a dense community right here. And that might be because the dense community is higher up or we're not on the right part of the seamount. We're only able to survey so much uh, in our short am amount of time here on the seafloor. Um, there could be other areas of the seamount that have dense communities, but that doesn't mean there aren't corals and sponges here. I am spotting uh, some a few corals here and there, um, primnoid corals and some bamboo corals, uh, amongst some other invertebrates on the seafloor. And there's actually a lot more life here than what we can see as we fly by. There are lots of animals in the sediment on these rocks that are very small. So as we zoom in, you might see more animals than what we, what we can see when we're flying um, three meters above the bottom. I feel like a sea pen can live pretty much anywhere, though. I, just, I, I feel like they can find any nook or cranny to make their home. Yeah, a lot of sea pens uh, will root themselves in the sediment. So when you have nice um, wide sediment areas or even just small stable patches of sediment, we usually see a sea pen in there. An uh, area like this where it looks like maybe the rocks have moved more recently, um, it might be more difficult for some of those sea pens to take root. But doesn't mean they're not here. Sea pens can also retract themselves underneath the sediment. So if they were recently disturbed, they might be there, but we're not going to be able to see them. Which is wild. I did not know that they moved outside of you know the the ocean current until like yesterday. Like they're basically like clams when they like slurp back into the into the sediment. Yeah, uh, there have been attempts to collect some different. Um, species of sea pen and, and they have definitely escaped collection by pulling themselves down underneath the sediment. Hey, Emily says she has an odd question for us about amber grease. Has anyone ever collected some? Okay, so that's what uh, the sperm whale like bile secretion that's used to make perfume, I believe. I believe that floats. It does float. Right. So you would find that on the uh, very uh, top of the ocean or um, on a shore somewhere. So here we are taking uh, a look at a sea urchin. This is a type of sea urchin that is commonly known as a pancake urchin. It's kind of flat. Uh, this one is Tromicosoma. And I really like it. Because uh, at the ends of the spines on the underside, uh, they have like little little boots on their spines, which is really cute. And that helps them move across the sediment and across the rocks that they're, uh, they're living on. What gives it its color? Well, I'm not exactly sure what gives it that purple color, um, but purple can also be helping in some camouflage. Uh, there aren't a lot of animals that are going to predate on a sea urchin, given how spiky it is and um, how little nutrition that, that they might provide. So I'm not exactly sure why that one is purple, but that one is always purple. Um, there are other ones uh, that are different colors. So you'll see sea urchins in white um, and, and they could be they could be a lot of different colors, which is really interesting. There has been some speculation on the use of color in the deep sea, and oh, uh, maybe it's just a a. Um, it, there, there's really nothing, sort of, keeping them from being colors because it is so dark down here. To us, it seems like, oh, wow, vibrant color uh, down the deep sea. But the animals here don't see that color in the same way that we do. And there, there's nothing bad about being purple in the deep sea.
they're a little less visible, right? You know, if you're on the, on the red side of the spectrum. That's right, yeah. Purple is a little harder to see um, in the deep sea. Uh, other animals tend to be translucent, which makes them difficult to see. Other animals can be red, which is also more difficult to see. A lot of animals that have yellow coloration, um, that could be a deterrent uh, chemical in their tissue. That keeps uh, other animals from predate, uh, predating on them. All right. So we just passed waypoint five, we're headed up to waypoint six, which is gonna be that um, kind of smaller knoll. Um, we're gonna be changing bearing to 258. Uh, we will get a little bit steeper, so maybe we'll do 50 meter steps. All right. Bridge nav. Can we get a five zero meter step bearing 258? Correct, thank you. So as we go up this slope here, we'll probably notice that there's going to be more hard substrate, more consolidated substrates. Uh, and, and those areas are going to be a little bit better for our coral and sponge communities. I've also been seeing a number of these brisingid sea stars on rocks. Those are those uh, pinkish, orangish sea stars. Megan, are you up for another deep sea biology question? Oh, absolutely. Always. Um, so we're talking about uh, why organisms can grow so lar so much larger on the sea floor as, appeared, as, as opposed to some of the relatives that are up closer to the uh, sea surface. So there is this pattern of uh, gigantism in the deep sea. Um, for certain animals, so like giant isopods or, or very large animals that are generally much smaller, say on the surface or on land. Um, and and that can be for a number of reasons. There There's some advantage to being large in the deep sea, um, but there's also disadvantages. Um, if you're larger, you can consume larger things uh, because food is sparse in the deep sea, you need to eat when you can. Um, and these animals live very slow lives. So they oftentimes animals living in the deep sea will, will live extremely long lives, um, eating very infrequently, which is kind of odd to us where we eat three times a day, maybe more, maybe a little bit less. Uh, some animals might only eat once uh, a year when they find something to eat. So being large can be an advantage so that when you find something, you can consume the whole thing. And that's why you might see uh, animals like gulper eels that can open their mouths and consume uh, large prey items. Um, but other things can be very small. So do really large organisms like like a giant squid, like we were talking about yesterday, do they get most of their nutrients by 
going up higher in the water column? Or? Some animals do vertically migrate through the water column. They will hide in the deeps during the day, and then at night, they will come closer to the surface to, to feed. Um, and you'll have small organisms trying to use the darkness as, as cover in order to not be seen. Um, and then other animals have adaptations in order to find um, those animals that are trying to, to hide. So it's sort of like an arms race of uh, trying to be not seen and not eaten and other animals trying to find prey. So it's a the fish eat fish world out there. Fish there's fish a fish. World. There's a there's a t-shirt that needs that on it, I believe. <laughs> All right, we are zooming on a fish right now. So I'm trying to take a look at the side of this fish. It looks like it could be a cusk eel. And what I'm looking at is the, the lateral line uh, to see if it is straight or if it, it, it sort of zigzags, because that could put it in a different family. But this one does look to be a cusk eel in the family Ophidiidae. Did you say a tusk eel? Cusk. Cusk eel. So cusk eels aren't actually eels. They are a type of fish that has this eel-like body form. You'll notice a lot of fish in the deep sea have a very eel-like body form because it's a really efficient form of swimming. It doesn't take a lot of energy. And with the limited food supply in the deep, you don't want to be using a lot of energy in order to get from place to place. So being very efficient is very useful. It's not the fastest way to get places, but there aren't a lot of reasons to move extremely fast down here.
There's another fish in view. Looks to be another cusk eel. It was in the upper left. Or upper right. This is a primnoid or a chrysogorgic coral, and then we have a bamboo coral with coral. So I've been seeing a number of these uh, chrysogorgic corals, uh, Ramulogorgia militaris. That name has actually recently been changed uh, to Ramulogorgia from uh, Pleurogorgia. So a new description of that species. A lot of work's been doing, uh, been working. A lot of people have been working on. Um, the genetics of some of these deep sea corals and uh, describing them a little bit better. So there's been a lot of changes in taxonomy, especially with the uh, bamboo corals. Uh, before recently, they were known as, as the family Isididae, and now these deep sea bamboo corals have uh, now their own family, Corrado Isididae. So the Ramula Gorgia, they, they seem to really enjoy these sort of steeper slopes. Um, you can see them sometimes in really dense um, aggregations on steep areas, uh, cliff, cliff faces or um, wall-like structures. Yeah, there seems to be, that, that looks like a dead piece of sponge. That looks like a dead piece of sponge in the lower left, yeah. Mm Yeah, we are always on the lookout for the weird and wonderful. Um, there's a likelihood that we will see new species on this dive, and we want to keep our eyes peeled for something that has never been seen before. So when we were looking at a fish earlier, there might have been something that we don't know what it is underneath it. Um, we're going to keep our eyes peeled for, for something similar along our way. We were talking a few nights ago about, um, you know, how we know, oh no, I think it was during a live interaction actually, um, how we know we've collected something new or we've seen something new. About how long does it take to find out whether we've seen something new or not? So experts will uh, chime in um, if they think it's something new, but in order to confirm that it is something new, you have to have a specimen collection of that animal and a taxonomist that's an expert in that field will describe it. Um, they will compare it against the descriptions of other animals that it could be. Um, and if they find that it is not any of the things that are known to science, they will write up a paper um, describing this animal and giving it its own scientific name. Uh, and that will be part of the literature that scientists can then use to identify animals that are the same. So oftentimes we make multiple collections of these uh, animals that are new to science in order to confirm that uh, identification. Yeah, this is a bamboo coral, a very long, uh, unbranched bamboo coral. And this one's kind of interesting because all the polyps appear to be on one side of the coral. Coral. So this could be uh, a bathygorgia. <laughs> yeah, bamboo whip corals can grow quite long. So we've seen them, you know, meters in length coming up off the seafloor. And being that high up off the seafloor, 
how it can be very advantageous to those coral polyps that are feeding in the water column. Because uh, as you get higher up off the seafloor, you can have better current, turbulent current, to bring more food to your polyps. And because corals are a colony, uh, polyps at the top of the colony, if they feed more than the ones at the bottom, they all help each other out. Now we're zooming in on a feather star, a few feather stars on these rocks. These feather stars are crinoids. They're a type of iconoderm, so related to sea stars and sea cucumbers. So there are still more of these um, Ramulogorgia corals. That's the, the main coral that I've been spotting along the seafloor here. So we're watching the oxygen levels, oxygen levels, and they're um, decreasing. Um, how? And we're still seeing corals. So how much oxygen depletion can a, a coral withstand? Do you know? So our our graph is a little exaggerated. Um, it it's has dropped a little bit, uh, <laughs> but it, not so much as to be considered an oxygen minimum zone. Uh, as we make our way up, you're going to see these fluctuations um, in the oxygen levels uh, because we're changing different water masses um, from deep to, to a little bit shallower. So different water masses will have different uh, chemistries to them. I went on my first oceanographic cruise when I was 17 on a script ship uh, off California and we did Nansen casts where we were collecting water samples as a function of depth. And in the shallow water casts, you would see the oxygen going down, 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 down. And there was a biologist in 1800s, Forbes, who predicted that there would be no life in the deep sea because it would finally go to zero until we did deep water casts. And I was doing a deep water cast and I was because when you do oxygen samples, you have to titrate them immediately. So two in the morning or whatever, and you're doing the titrations, and you're watching it go down, 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 and then all of a sudden it started to increase and increase till you reach the bottom. And I, professor says, so did you screw up? And I said, I, I don't know. I can tell you that all the other casts, it, it didn't increase. And he said, this was a deep cast. What caused it? You know what causes the oxygen to increase near the bottom? Antarctic bottom water. So you have, up in the polar regions, you have violent storms and you're oxygenating the water. And 
water reaches its maximum density around 3.5 to 4 degrees centigrade and becomes the densest. And then it expands, and that's why lakes don't freeze from the bottom up. Because the oxygen molecule, as it stops its brownie motions of vibration, the two positive hydrogen uh, atoms repel one another to 109 degrees and it expands. So that cold water falls down to the bottom of the ocean and circulates and provides oxygen throughout the world through this deep water circulation, bringing that oxygen down. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any life on the bottom of the ocean. But it's that circulating oxygenated water from the polar regions that why it increases. There's another little. Yeah, can we take a look at this fish? Looking oh, downward. There it goes. <laughs> All right, we're going to be reaching Yeah, that looked our... like a rat tail fish. Is there more recent comments on that? I didn't know if you scrolled. No, that was it. All right. Well, here we go. Should hopefully see more life. We'll see, but the oxygen continues to go down. So, Bob, when uh, we talked before the cruise, you introduced yourself as a geologist. Is yeah. that how you introduce yourself? Because on well, Wikipedia, it says you're a marine archaeologist. Well, I'm, you'll find me as a biologist, a geologist. Wherever I went and wandered out of my field, then I picked up a new title. <laughs> but when I went to college, I quadruple majored. I had two ma majors and two minors. I majored in chemistry and geology, and I minored in physics and mathematics. And it took five years to get, it was 160 credits instead of 130. But that broad-based background. But my favorite classes were history classes. <laughs> were what? History classes. So I just studied, a, you know, I love everything. And so when I wander into, you know, when we found hydrothermal vents and the chemosynthetic systems there, I became, a, all of a sudden people were saying I'm a marine biologist. And when I found ancient shipwrecks, I became a, a marine archaeologist. Uh, I'm an explorer. I, I'm an equal opportunity. <laughs> I love everything. Uh, so I enjoy all aspects of it. And uh, I think it's important to have that broad because you're going to have to reinvent yourself. You don't get a career now and, and, and stay in it for, I'm now 79 years old, okay? And so you, I, I tend to reinvent myself every 15 to 20 years just out of interest of going down roads. I went down the archaeological road for 22 years. But the first... The shipwreck I ever found was the Titanic, so it was a, quite a place to start. But then uh, I got interested in going further back into time, and that drew me into the Black Sea, because the Black Sea has no oxygen at all. It's the largest reservoir dissolved hydrogen sulfide on Earth. And we found perfectly preserved shipwrecks with human remains on them from wow. 150 B.C., and the ships were still had rigging on their mast. I mean, they still had uh, cordage on them. It was you could see the carpenters add marks because they didn't use saws. They used an ad like a little axe to take a round thing and make it square. But now we're 
characterizing America's EEZ. This is the equivalency of the second Lewis and Clark expedition, but we, <laughs> since our team's dominated by women, we call it the Lewis and Clark expedition. <laughs> but our mission here is to characterize the 50% of our country that's beneath the sea. Imagine we went to the moon before we went to this part of America. Think about it. We went to the moon before this is the first time a human being has seen this part of America. Really? You know, it's just crazy. Uh, for those who don't know, the EEZ is the exclusive economic zone. So coastal countries have access. Um, it's up to 200 nautical miles. Unless they bump into another country. Yeah. Then and then they have to negotiate. Yeah, then it's a little sketchy there. Well, we've been able to even negotiate with Cuba because we bump into their EEZ. Yeah, so Florida and Cuba... They bump into each other. And the Bahamas yes. as well. And then Canada. And then over uh, in in uh, this neck of the woods also in, in the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico. So you, the, the Law of the Sea Convention defines the rules of engagement for negotiation. But if you can prove your continental shelf exceeds the 200 miles, nautical miles, you can go into... United Nations and file for extension. Yeah. But since America has never officially signed the Law of the Sea Convention, we cannot, we're not allowed to extend our boundary. Obvious it would be in the north, north of Alaska and the North Slope. Uh, other countries signed. So this is really sad that we still have not officially signed the Law of the Sea Convention. Yeah. So we're an outsider when it comes to being able to extend, it's called the extended continental shelf. Yep. I could tell you the six senators, but I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, to be a member of the Law of the Sea Convention, um, sometimes it's called UNCLOS, uh, you, it needs to be ratified and President, I think President Clinton had signed it but um not. but to be completely ratified it needs to go through the congress and the uh through the senate and through the senate and it has not been able to do that yet yep. so the convention i think went into effect in 1996 and we still are not in i mean it. Uh, everyone's observes it everyone observes that we were able to do the negotiations but the we it still has not been consummated yeah. Yeah, the U.S. still follows the rules, but not a member yet. But then you have certain rites of passage. I mean, there's international laws that permit you to pass through someone's waters because yeah. it's an international. For example, uh, it's really when we were working in the Black Sea and we were go to Istanbul to the restaurant and you could see a restaurant across the straits and, and then boats would be going by your table. While you were having dinner, and this giant boat would go by, because that's a rite of passage. <clears throat> Even though Turkey owns the real estate <clears throat> underneath it. I saw one of your uh, flailing little white animals. It was in the lower left, but it's out of the screen now. So hopefully we'll see another one of them. Yeah, this was, like was, long, was it creamy? And cream colored. colored. Yeah. It was probably... Like, Maybe that long. Yeah, it'd be cool to just zoom in on it next time. And yeah, so it was swimming. So. Oh, this was swimming. No, this was a line on the bottom. Almost looked like an antler, if you yeah. want to know the truth. Like it kind of, it saw us coming and it sort of, I don't know, jumped. Oh, that's a holothurian will do that. Does that dance? No, it wasn't a holothurian. It looked more too elongated okay. to be a holothurian. Well, um, let's see what... Because they, I've seen more than one, so hopefully we'll see even more. But it would be nice to just eyeball it and image it. We were talking about uh, careers earlier, and Bob just mentioned, <coughs> Dr. Ballard just mentioned um, quite a bit about his career. Um, so someone is saying that they've had a bit of a, a sorted uh, 
background um, collegiately and wondering if they could ever take on a career such as ourselves. There's several different careers on board. So I, I don't think there's two people that went down the same path to get into yeah, this exactly. room. But you can go on the website and look up everyone and and they are asked, you know, how did they get here? So go to the nautiluslive.org website, which obviously you're doing. But up at the top, you see who's on watch and you click on those people and there's a profile of, of how they got there. And uh, this is a equal opportunity employer, I got to tell you. We not only do uh, STEM, we do STEAM. I'm a big advocate of introducing the visual arts uh, because I'm dyslexic and I learn visually and I'm field geologist and so uh, it's critical to bring in the uh, my my daughter's a television production. My wife was a TV producer for National Geographic. So there's a little, little starfish. So I'm big on s steam, <laughs> bringing this is a in slime star artists, authors, uh, various ways to communicate. My hero was Captain Nemo, and I I didn't read the book. I went, I watched the movie. There's a sea cucumber a whole thing we're starting to pick up some more life now as we get closer to the summit i always love to like climbing everest i always like to summit <laughs> and generally there's more action up there but we'll see on the last cruise that wasn't necessarily the case it was on the ridge lines Yeah, I've noticed that a lot of the seamounts that have the flat tops. Those are guillotes. Yeah, the guillotes. They were beveled when they went underwater. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, a famous scientist by the name of Harry Hess, a geologist at Princeton University, who was one of, along with uh, Bob Dietz, were one of the first to propose the theory of plate tectonics. During World War II, he was a, a skipper of a destroyer out of Pearl Harbor. And he had an echo sounder. And he was running around up here and saw the first flat top seamount. And it was just like a mesa. But it was, so what happens is at the hot spot, where, which is where Hawaii, the big island of Hawaii, is where the hot spot is. And we call them thunderheads of the mantle. There's storms inside the earth that are blasting their way up like a welder's torch but they're fixed in space within the earth, whereas the plate's moving over the top of it, and it, it pops out islands. Mm -hmm. And Hawaii, the whole big island, is, is, being, is still being made. In fact, a new island is under uh, being made uh, to the northeast of it called Loi, which oh, yeah, I yeah. dove on it. Yeah, I saw that uh, episode yeah. where you were diving <clears throat> with Terry Kirby. Well, that's when... The, ultimately, it'll it'll become the dominant, uh, and then the Big Island will go away. But the age difference, for example, so it's a time series. Kauai is five, five million years, so five million years ago, it was over the hot spot. <clears throat> but as the this massive uh, massif of, of 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 lava that made the island gets cold. It, it, it contracts and it sinks back underwater. If you go along what's called the Emperor Seamount chain, which is the Hawaiian chain, and then it makes a big turn, and that's because the plate changed direction. So you have this big turn, but as you go along it, there's a time sequence. But as it goes underwater, uh, volcanoes are not well built, <laughs> and so they're, they're easily eroded. And so it literally bevels it at when it gets to shoreline, and then that that flat top then goes under. And so it's fascinating to see them because when they first saw them, they were trying to figure it out because this is pre-understanding hotspots. This is World War II when they found these first guillotes, and they're really wild looking. Yeah, I don't think any of these guys because this is not a hotspot trace. These I don't think were ever subaerial. Uh, these the seamounts we're on right now, they never, to my knowledge, made it to the surface. Uh, uh, so they are not beveled. I mean, maybe some of this, if we get up to the top, 
but it looks pretty conical. Yeah, it does look pretty conical, yeah. and it'll <coughs> become obvious if it was um, close to the surface at any point. Yeah, because um, you also get carbonates mm -hmm. uh, in the growth of uh, in the Bahama Islands, for example. In the early opening of the North Atlantic Ocean, around the uh, it was in the uh, late Triassic, early Jurassic period, about 180 million years ago, as as the Atlantic Ocean began to unzip, there was a fracture zone. And that fracture zone, uh, when you split it, you get a, what's called leaky transform fault. In other words, it, it starts to create volcanism. And you created a chain of islands. But then as the lithosphere, the, the oceanic lithosphere is heavier than the continents. If you look at, if you took a, a cubic foot of granite, which is a typical silicious uh, igneous rock with a feldspar, lots of, of, of sodium, potassium, aluminum silicates, and you put that cubic foot on a waterbed, naturally it would sink into the waterbed. Mm -hmm. If you took a cubic foot of oceanic crust, which is more mafic minerals, more iron, magnesium silicates, and you put it on the waterbed, it sinks deeper. So the reason oceans are down is they're sinking deeper into the asthenosphere, whereas continents are are lighter. And so uh, that's why you have that differential. That's why you can't find. If you go on the web and look at look up what's, uh, 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 just type it, uh, age of the oceanic lithosphere. And it, take a peek at, type age of the oceanic lithosphere, and you'll see a picture. I call it the bleeding earth. And it shows you the age of the lithosphere there it is. Click on that puppy. And that shows you how old the oceanic crust is at any particular spot. And you'll notice that it's naturally ground zero is the axis of the mid-ocean ridge. That's where it's being made now. But you'll notice the ages. We know the Earth's 4.5 billion years old, but we can't find 4.5 billion years old rocks in the ocean because they've been subducted. Mm -hmm. Where do you think, without looking really quick, the oldest oceanic lithosphere is? It's going to be um, where the trenches are. Mediterranean. Which basin you mean? The Mediterranean. Because there was an ancient sea uh, uh, called the Tethys. And this sea stretched from Portugal to the Philippines all along that subduction zone was a great ocean that then was closed as Africa, India, and, and Middle East plates began to converge on the Eurasian plates. And it's eating the Tethys in the trenches uh, of, uh, of the uh, Hellenic trenches in uh, south of Crete. It's eating the old lithosphere until it finally continent, continent collision, which is what you have where India is finally closed the door and it's eaten all of that ancient Tethys oceanic lithosphere. It's really cool. That is cool. And you'll notice the the bands are are uh, broader bands in the Pacific Ocean because the plates are moving faster. Yeah. So your spreading rates are much faster, which means your heat budget is much greater and that's why we found the hydrothermal vents, the black smokers initially there because they're so pervasive because there's so much heat coming out mm -hmm. of the, because of the place. And, and that's why we call it the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where there's a mountain range and the East Pacific Rise because it's pulled apart, has very little elevation because it's moving so fast. It pulls the topography out. So it's just fun to know how the Earth works. And uh, you, you should... You can't believe what we were being told pre-plate tectonics. Gobbledygook. Marshall K's geosynclinal cycle. And then you went, well, walk me through that. Well, you have a mountain. Yeah, I got a mountain. You have rain falling on it. Yeah. It weathers and erodes it. Yeah. The dirt goes downstream. Got it. Look at the Mississippi. Goes out in to the ocean and it's deposited in the myogeosyncline, eogeosyncline, and then a mountain range comes up. And I said, I missed that last step. 
how did the mountain range suddenly appear? Because they were vertical tectonicists. They said, well, you finally got so much sediment, you melted it and mobilized it. Complete gobbledygook. But you need to write it down to get an A on your paper. So science is a work in progress, full of surprises. So here we are. Getting, now we're getting more pillows. See those the tub, tubular uh, that were flowing down the slope as the, we're about at our maximum vertical slope here. And then it'll crest. Dr. Ballard, we've got a nice comment here for you from Chris Fritzen. Beg your pardon? Got a nice comment here for me, for you from Chris Fritzen. Yeah. Loving that uh, you encourage the artistic side of science. Also wonders for the team leader or lead scientist when they got into the math side of science. Yes. Well, math, you know, if you can't reduce it to math, you don't know what you're doing. <coughs> Here we go. This is getting interesting. Look at the overhangs now. Oh, yeah. We are seeing a lot more econoderms here. We've got some brittle stars. What's and that white a stuff? Singet sea see, star. See that lower left? Is that sediments, I guess? Yeah, it's sediment. Yeah. I'm always looking for something new. Here we go. Megan, this would be a great time for this chat question. How do biologists remember all of the complicated classifications and subtle distinctions? I also wonder that. I just wonder if you are superhuman or if there's a way for mere mortals to learn this. <laughs> Latin, Latin helps, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, knowing the Latin does help a little bit because sometimes the Latin name can actually give you a little hint as to what the organism looks like or does. Um, the other way I remember all these things is that I lo I'm looking at them a lot. So uh, I use our animals guides a lot. Um, on available online and as you use the animal guide it's actually organized taxonomically yeah. so that can that. actually help you learn the higher taxonomic classifications um, in addition to um, the scientific names and and as you hear these names over and over again they start to stick in your mind um, yeah. and that way you know just practice makes perfect yeah, geology is full of thousands and thousands of terms that, you know, you sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Yeah, I mean, just all of the minerals that go into but one rock. Just geologic epochs and yeah. geologic periods and uh, just unbelievable terms. Have you memorized all of the geologic periods? Oh, God, yes. Excuse <laughs> me. Yes. Yeah, look at that. You had to. You had to know your geologic uh, table. First with the Precambrian and then Paleozoic, Mesozoic, uh, Cenozoic, and then you further broke it down, further broke it down, further broke it down, yeah. You had to know that. When uh, one of my graduate students takes their written exams, I give them a sheet of paper, okay? And I give them the location of 15 cities across the planet. And I said, now draw the earth from memory. and then put in all the plates and then grade yourself. <laughs> so imagine a sheet of paper, I give you 10 cities. Now I'm gonna not put them all in one place. <laughs> so I'll give you Beijing, I'll give you Paris, I'll give you whatever, and I'll give you 12 cities and I'll give you 10 point dividers and I'll say now draw the earth from memory. Can you draw the earth? So and are you drawing they know it's coming and everything? Yeah, you know, I want you to draw the earth from memory, all the continents, so all the plates, and you better know it, and you're going to, I'm telling you a year in advance, I'm going to ask you that question. Okay. So you better have it memorized in your head. <laughs> yeah, that would be a rough pop quiz. It's good that we it's would have plenty of preparation time. <laughs> I give you a year to prepare yourself for it, and then grade yourself. See how you did. I want all the spreading centers. I want all the transform faults. I want all the subduction zones. 
and you can do it. I I love, you know, when you're watching uh, Apple TV or something, and it goes to satellite flying around. I love to watch and figure out where I am on the planet by just flying over it from space at pretty ho low altitude. And, and sit there and, and say, well, here's what's coming. It's so, so much fun. Because <laughs> the Earth is a integrated system. So if you're, <clears throat> you don't just study the ocean, you have to study the whole planet. But it just turns out that 72% of it's underwater. But I've spent as much time scaling volcanoes on land. I did all my field geology initially on land before I started field geology underwater. And that's all we're doing here is we're doing field geology. We got a map. We're doing what are called vertical transits. And you want to figure it out. That looks like a squid. Yeah, I think we have a follower Yeah, in the Argus view. That's a squid, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Normally more than one. Surprise, just a solo. Maybe it's a vampire. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> Boy, that can. <clears throat> it's interesting when fish come in and harvest your light to find things. Say, oh, yeah. They know, definitely I've been, I've been use down those. here in the dark, and thanks for bringing in the flashlight. <laughs> yep. Makes it so much easier to see all the things you want to eat. <clears throat> it's like a buffet lit up for everyone. I actually had a question about light. I'm sure it is listed on the uh, on our website, nautiluslive.org. But what kind of light are we using? Is it anything special that would help us better see uh, more translucent? Well, organisms? let's let the pilot. You want to answer that question? Wants it to know what kind of lights we're using. We're using uh, sea light spheres from Deep Sea Power and Light. They are, oh, what do they call it? Uh, Neutral white, I think they're called. I couldn't tell you the color temperature on them. You want to sit? But they're between five, depending on the model, they're between five and 10,000 lumens each. And we have about uh, to tw eight, tw 12 on Hercules. I think the current config is 12. So lighting is interesting underwater because you have a lot of particulates, uh, the, what we call marine snow, which is both inorganic and organic falling down from the euphotic zone above, sort of like an underwater uh, snow. And all of you, I'm sure, have driven in the fog. And you know when you're driving in the fog, <clears throat> if you turn on your high beams, you, can, you can't see as well as you can with your low beams because you have all of those water particles between you and what you're trying to see, and you're getting that what we call backscatter. An interesting thing to do is when you get fog someday, and let's say you're, you're parked, so park your car, turn on your high beams and get out of your car and walk to the side, and you'd be surprised how far you can see because you're not looking through the backscatter. You're coming in at, at an angle, and that, that water is not being aggravated or reflective, and you can see much, much further by getting out of it, but it's pretty hard to do while you're driving. But the, there's an ultimate limit to how far you can see, but the best situation is what we have right now with Hercules. It's called a self-lit object. Uh, if you were to turn off Argus's lights, uh, don't know, is that a big problem to boot them up and boot them down? No, nope, no problem at turn, all. Turn Argus off. Now zoom in a little and look how clear it is. Stop. See how, because you don't, you're not looking through your high beams. And that is a really, I, I prefer this way of driving around. Because I can now, if Hercules rose up a little, could you rise up just a little to light more landscape? Yeah, when we were looking uh, for Amelia Earhart's plane, we used this as our primary search tool. We would get higher up. Here's a fish. And then you would, it'll light up much more. The whole screen will be Zoom filled in. with uh, 
Yeah, there we go, little guy there. So he's really close in. You can see the burning almost on the sediments with his lights. But if he were to rise up and you can zoom back out, you, he'd light up the whole countryside. And so I actually prefer that as a, when I'm hunting, is to be, use Argus as a giant self-lit light bulb down there. All so right, come by, thank you. You can turn your lights back on, but watch what happens when, it, when you do that. Boom. You light up a little more, but look how the, you're getting that burning. So there you are. The underwater physics of light. But the best light is a thallium iodide light, blue-green. Blue-green lights go much further underwater. They're less attenuated. You go from ultraviolet to infrared, and red is a higher frequency light, and you, you can't see red uh, from, a, a, from a 10 meters. You have to get close. It's, it's attenuated. And so when sometimes when you see your biological samples and then you get really close, all of a sudden they become red or yellow or orange. Pilot, can we zoom that coral? Yeah, you bet. Go ahead, zoom. It's a sea pen, isn't it? This is a black coral. Yeah, okay. Looks like a sea pen. This is a bathypathies, a type of black coral. See how close he is. And now if you were to be looking at that from Argus, it wouldn't be that color. You couldn't see the color. All right, thanks, Kamad. All right. What's local time? Oh. Is that breakfast yet? What time? <laughs> it is 5.49 oh, a.m. local Not, time. No breakfast yet. Breakfast is at 8? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, they just blur. I don't even know what day of the week it is. It's, it's Friday because I've got my octopus pants on. And there we go. Happy Octopus Friday. I love that. Is that a thing? Did we just make that? Octopus Friday? Or is I that want octopus pants. Um, actually, Octopus Friday has been a thing for a little while. Um, hopefully we can see an octopus today. That would be really cool. Uh, and, I, and I always wear my octopus pants on Friday so I know what day it is. <laughs> that, that's how you tell time on octopus the ship. Octopus pants, you say? Yeah, I've got they have eight legs. Yeah, they've got like octopus arms all over them. So on that note, we are what about twelve hours into this dive because we started about five o'clock yesterday evening. Yep. Ish. Yeah. Um. So this dive is going to be a, uh, around twenty-four hours.